we are back and we have been looking at this prolog small pro program which is used to determine whether whether an in input argument x occurs in the list which is a second argument so this occurs has got uh, a schema of two arguments element list and it looks for element in the list and if it finds it it returns true we saw this program last time and i had also mentioned that the first clause is kind of redundant so we can actually work with the second uh, program which simply says that x occurs in a list which starts with x that's the first clause the second clause says that x occurs in a list if it occurs in the tail of the list essentially and here are some more examples uh, if you ask whether 3 occurs in this list 2 2 3 first it will say yes then looking for another answer it will say false that's because it's trying to give you all answers it will look at the entire list before it gives up if you ask whether 4 occurs in the same list it will simply say false and that will be the end of it. If you simply give a variable and say is there something which is there in the list then it will enumerate all the elements. So, first it will say 2 then another 2 then 3 and then say there is nothing more and that prologue's way of saying that is that false fine I cannot find any more answers. We can also do the same kind of program when the second argument is a term. So, it is a functor name with some number of arguments and the definition is analogous as you can see. It is either the first argument of that functor or it is a later argument of the functor essentially. So, some more examples, the 2 does not occur in nil, but if you say does 2 occur in this f of 2 of f of 2, so it is a nested definition uh, of the function of the term. So, it occurs in this place, so it says true, it occurs in this place, so it says true, then it cannot find any more, so then it says false. But as I had said earlier, if you use a cut operator, it will just tell you whether it occurs in, in the list or the term in this case as the, as the case may be and stops with one answer essentially. So, we will look at cut. We have already seen the definition of append. So, let us kind of revise that again. So, here is a definition given here which uh, says that first clause says that an empty list appended to an empty list will give you an empty list. Remember that the third clause, the third argument to the predicate is the appended list. The second clause says that if you take an empty list and append it to a list containing head and tail, then you will get the same list containing the head and tail. The third argument is a recursive clause which says that if, a, if you take a list of x's and if you take a list of y's and it gives you a list of z's, then it is also true that if you up, if you start, if you, con, if you put x at the head of x's, then append with the same y's, you will get z's with the list of x. So, we have seen this definition before. So, you could also write this in a, in a, in a style similar to that we wrote add. So, you could say for example, you could define a list essentially. You could say uh, an empty list is a list, then you could say
Okay, I am mixing up uppercase and lowercase. I hope that does not matter. It is very similar to the definition of natural numbers. 0 is a natural number and successor of 0 is a successor of any, any natural number is a natural number. So, here we are saying an empty list is a list and if you put anything at the head of it, uh, any, anything at the head of any list, then you will get an empty list. Then you do not have to go into some of this uh, complex stuff that we have written here. Uh, the sim the these two clauses can be com combined into saying that append empty list x x provided list x. But they are equivalent definitions, so either should work. Uh, they are almost equivalent, I think. The definition I have written is slightly better, logically speaking. So, again, if you now ask this query that if I take 1 and 2 and append it to 3, what is the z I will get? It says z will be 1, 2, 3. You can say if I take 1 and 2 and append it to something, will I get the list containing 1, 2, 3? Then it will say yes, that something must be the list containing 3. Remember that all the arguments must be lists here. Precisely. And of course, it says false because it cannot find any other answer. So, wherever there are variables, it will look for other answers. x can be the first argument, this can be the second argument and 1, 2, 3 is same. It will again come back and say yes, x equal to 1 and 2. So, by now, I think we are familiar with this process, the way prolog works, I think. If we give two variables in the query, is there an x and is there a y such that when we append them together, you will get the list 1, 2, 3 and prolog will enumerate all the possibilities for you essentially. So, first it says x is empty list and y is a target list. So, then it will say x is a list containing only 1 and y is a list containing 2 and 3. Then it will say x is a list containing 1 and 2 and y is a list containing 3. Then finally, it will say x is a target list and y is an empty list. All four these things it will enumerate for you essentially. If you take the same query and add another question to that, that is the length of y 2, then it will give you only one answer, which is when y is equal to 2. As an exercise, I will ask you to define the length function in prolog. So, the arguments to the length function should be, the first argument should be a list and the second argument should be a number and the meaning of that predicate would be that as shown here, 2 is the length of a list called y. Now, we have seen that many of the programs that we have written are recursive programs. They look at some part as a base clause and then they look at the rest of the data structure as a recursive clause essentially. And we have seen in the examples that we have seen, for example, membership of uh, um, element in the list or appending to list, that when the two arguments are finite, when the arguments are finite and we will not go into the detailed definition, there is a very well defined notion of what do you mean by finite here. But in our case, when for example, the, the list is of length 3 or the two arguments are length 1 and 2 or whatever, as long as we are dealing with finite structures, we will have finite recursion and it will try out all possibilities and terminate. But sometimes, for example, if you look at the set of natural numbers, there is an infinite set there. You can get into infinite recursion. Infinite recursion can be of two types. 
One is that you have somehow got into a long infinite loop. So, we discussed uh, uh, some time ago that uh, uh, you can have a rule which says if x is married to y, then y is married to x. And we saw that there was a possibility of getting into an infinite loop doing nothing there. So, that could that is a possibility that could happen if your program is written which has that this thing. Today, today we, here also we saw this definition of above and below which are kind of the opposites of each other and they could get into an infinite loop calling each other all the time. The other way that infinite uh, uh, recursion can happen is when you are looking at infinite structures like the set of natural numbers. We have probably seen this before, but let us do a quick recap. Uh, we are talking about our knowledge base of three blocks. So, we have our three blocks A, then B, then C. That is given to us as a knowledge base A is on B and B is on C. And then we have a definition for above. The definition of above, there are three definitions we are looking at. Uh, one is called above, one is called above 2 and the third is called above 3. All three have the same base clause that if x is above y, x is on y, then x is above y. The base clause is the same. The recursive clause is different and this will take us into this area of rule ordering essentially. Uh, ordering, which order is a good order to write the antecedents it. So, as an example, why ordering matters, then this is an example, uh, for example, this says that uh, if you have an American cousin, so let us use AC for American cousin x y or y is an American cousin of x. If cousin and we had seen the definition of cousin x y and let me use a for American y. So, y is an American cousin of x if y is a cousin of x and y is American. Now, just imagine an alternate definition where I say I just use a different order x y American y and cousin x y. The same logically it is saying the same thing. Logically it is saying that x is an American y is an American cousin of x if y is a cousin of x and y is American. Procedurally and that is what impacts prologue, the order in which you write the two antecedents matters a lot. Now, just imagine that I ran the first version of the program which is this one. What I say is there is the Suresh have an American cousin then what will it do? It will search through your database, you know again top to down and so on and look for somebody which can be shown to be a cousin of Suresh. So, it will look at the cousin of Suresh, it will find a cousin of Suresh in the database if there exists, otherwise it will say false and then check whether that person is American or not. Compare this with the second way of writing the same rule. It says y is an American cousin of x if y is an American. So, if you were to execute this, what would you be doing? You would saying you look at all people and say, oh, is this person an American? If yes, then is he a cousin of or is she a cousin of Suresh? So, it will go through all the Americans before it finds a cousin, whereas the first clause will look at all the cousins and then find an American. So, you can see that efficiency wise the first definition is much more efficient than the second definition. So, order matters a lot in prologue essentially. 
So, we have just two three definitions of above here. The base clause is the same is that if x is uh, above y, if x is on y, then x is above y. Then one definition says that x is above y if x is on y and y is above z. So, what are we trying to say here? We are trying to say here is that x is here, then y is below that and somewhere there there is a z. So, we are searching from the top and saying is there something which is which x is on and is that thing above z. Whereas, if you look at the other two definitions, their first clause is the recursive clause which is the above clause. This is called left recursion because the recursion recursive clause comes first and then the other clauses come. Whereas, this is called tail recursion and tail recursion is known to be efficient essentially. In this query, in the second query above 2, what are we saying? That x will be above z if there is some y somewhere such that x is above y and that y is sitting on z. You can imagine the kind of search that you have to do here to try out different y's and then see whether that y is sitting on z. It is analogous to the example of the American cousin that I gave her. Uh, the basic problem is the same essentially. The third definition does not even use the on in the recursive clause, it uses above and above. Now, you see that this will indeed find a solution. Just think about this and you will see that it indeed find a solution. The question is about efficiency essentially. So, we will come back to this. This is to do with goal ordering and uh, we will look at this in a little bit more detail when we come back.